Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or depending on where you're located. Thanks for joining us today with this Catapult webcast. My name is Kurt Curtin. I'm the uh, CATI Technical Manager for Simulation and Electrical Products, and I'll be helping out today. So thanks for joining us today. Let me introduce today's presenter. Mr. Bill Roos is one of our simulation specialists out of our Louisville, Kentucky office. He's a highly experienced and, and very competent simulation expert who's been using these tools since their early introduction into the SOLIDWORKS interface. And Bill has put together a very informative presentation for us today. So Bill, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Great. Well, thank you, Kurt. Uh, I'm not sure how easily I can live up to that fabulous introduction, but uh, as Kurt said, uh, welcome everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you're at. A big statement that you see on screen is what was written about this webcast. Um, basically, in a nutshell, I'm going to show you a neat example for using both SOLIDWORKS simulation and SOLIDWORKS flow simulation for analyzing a product. Uh, today, the agenda that I'm going to go through, and specifically what we're going to do, is we're going to look at both thermal and structural analysis of a PCB assembly inside an electronic enclosure. Once we're finished with that, we'll go through fluid dynamic analysis of the electronic enclosure, including the PCB assembly. And then finally, we'll couple the two together. Will we use the uh, CFD results in FEA? Now, one note before we really begin here, this product could truly be anything. Any product with structural performance requirements, thermal management requirements, fluid effects, uh, this is just an example. It can be, uh, we can use these tools on any, virtually any product. So let's take a look a little bit further. Uh, here's our electronics enclosure. It's uh, just a power supply. Uh, a couple of things about it. There are some integrated circuits under the aluminum heat sinks. There's forced airflow through the enclosure. Uh, we need to take into account the conduction heat transfer as well as convection uh, through the enclosure and just common materials for the electronic components. Those are all things that we'll need to pay attention to. Uh, we also have some design constraints that we need to meet. Uh, for instance, we have a maximum out-of-plane deflection that our circuit board can withstand. Uh, we want to keep it under a certain amount. That way we wouldn't break any of the copper traces inside the board. We also have some temperature requirements for the integrated circuits. They would need to stay under 100 degrees C during use, otherwise our power supply is going to shut down. So that's a quick overview. So the first thing we're going to do is take a look at how we can use SOLIDWORKS simulation for analyzing our enclosure. And just a quick note, uh, this is a brief overview of the SOLIDWORKS simulation packaging. There are a number of different levels. Uh, the important things to know is what we're going to do today is linear static analysis of an assembly. We can do that with really any version of SOLIDWORKS simulation, but that starts with SOLIDWORKS Premium. And then we're also going to use thermal analysis capabilities, which does require SOLIDWORKS simulation professional. So let's first begin to our electronic enclosure. Uh, the first thing is this is a plastic clamshell enclosure. We have some steel end plates. There's a power plug, a number of different connections. Uh, multiple components are mounted to the circuit board, and we can even see some of the wiring there. You'll notice there are several cutouts on the end plates. Uh, that's where we have the airflow either coming into or exiting the enclosure. Now, I don't want to analyze the full PCB enclosure. I just want to focus initially on just the circuit board. So I'm going to switch to a CAD file of just the PCB assembly. And then I've got a number of components, the small capacitors, which aren't going to contribute structurally. So I'm going to go to a simplified configuration that I already have set up in this CAD model. And this is where I'm going to start for my thermal analysis. All right, so next slide. For thermal analysis, we really have two different things that we need to do. Uh, the first is we need to take into account thermal inputs, uh, so heat power from integrated circuits, transformers, capacitors, and we need to add something to the thermal FEA study for energy, energy dissipation, basically forced convection. Um, so this is what we need to set up here. Uh, as far as the natural convection, maybe you've done a little bit of research and you found a table like you see on the bottom right. And we're not doing natural convection. We're doing air, uh, forced convection. And that gives us a range, a general ballpark range, of what common heat transfer coefficients for 
forced air convection could be, and we see that that ranges between 20 and 300 watts per square meter degree Kelvin. Now we're going to be a little bit conservative up front. You remember, we had a number of components that were inside the enclosure that are going to prevent the airflow from really going through cleanly. So rather than starting off with 20 as our H value, we're going to start out with 10. So this is what we need to do here. We're going to go into SOLIDWORKS simulation. We're going to start a new thermal study. We're going to give it a name. In this case, we'll just call it power supply. And here, when I start looking through the list of all the components, you'll notice the materials have already been assigned. These were pre-assigned in each of the parts of this assembly. Here I'm looking at my global contact condition. And for a thermal study, what bonded means is it's assuming perfect conduction between all components. So that's a pretty big assumption. Now what we need to get into is specifying heat power for each of the different components. And you'll notice I used the keep visible push pin here. That's because I have multiple inputs that I need to define. So I'll go ahead and select those. So I'll use the Flyout Feature Manager design tree. I'll select both of the integrated circuits. And we'll apply 10 total watts that need to be dissipated by those components. Now I just need to continue on and add the heat power inputs for the large capacitor, the small capacitors, and the transformers that are being highlighted as I make the different selections on screen, or actually from the Flyout Feature Manager design tree. So I do need to make sure that I'm assigning the correct heat power inputs for each component or group of components, and definitely need to pay attention to if that's a per item input or a total heat power input. All right, the next thing that we need to do is we need to add our convection boundary condition. So we could try and select individual faces or whatnot. We'll just go ahead and start entering some of the values. Uh, in this case, my ambient temperature I know is in degree C, so I'm going to switch to metric to enter that quickly. And then I'll just go back to SI, since I, I know 10 watts per meter square degrees Kelvin is what I want. I'm going to click the button, select all exposed faces. That's going to choose every external face for the entire assembly. So that button really makes things quick for me. Uh, I'm going to hide that because it, it makes my graphics window a little bit uh, convoluted there for a bit. All right, the other thing that I'm going to mention is, let's say I wanted to assign different values to different components. One of the things you might consider is creating a selection set, nice little CAD tool for selecting individual faces from a component. That'll speed up a little bit of your, your setup for your FEA study. So back to our power supply thermal FEA study. The next thing we need to do is go into our study properties. Here, I want to make sure that I'm going to use the Intel Direct Spar Solver. Uh, in my personal testing, the Intel Direct Spar Solver is actually faster for thermal analyses. And we're just going to verify that this is a steady state thermal analysis. Now what we're going to do is choose one of our meshing algorithms. Maybe we'll tweak our mesh size just a little bit, make it a little bit smaller for this particular study. And we'll generate a mesh for our overall assembly. Now this is going to take just a couple of moments. And as soon as it's finished, we're going to see our initial mesh that we're going to use for this thermal FEA study. The curvature-based mesh gave us a little bit more mesh refinement on the curve features in our model. Now the only thing we have to do is click the Run button and monitor what's happening during the solution. And as soon as it's finished, um, for a thermal study here, this, if I recall, only took about six or seven seconds to solve. So what we're going to do, oops, missed a slide there. What we're going to do as soon as that's finished is just start reviewing our thermal FEA results. Nope. Went back, to, went back one slide. Sorry about that. All right, so I guess I, I guess I better just explain thermal FEA results here. We get temperature distribution and heat flux are the two primary outputs. And recall that we wanted our integrated circuits to be less than 100 degrees C. All right, so now I think I have the video for results. All right, so this is a temperature profile of the entire assembly. It's showing a maximum temperature of 173.6. But what I really need to do is focus on the temperature of just a couple of components. So I'm going to create a new result plot. I'm going to use an advanced option called Show Plot Only on Selected Entities. And I'm going to select just the two integrated circuits. I'm also going to use a chart option so that my legend is only for the temperatures of my two integrated circuits. So now I can focus on one of my design requirements is verifying that these two ICs are actually under 100 degrees C. 
And we can see for this initial study that the maximum temperature is actually close to 115 degrees C. So I need to make some changes at this point. Now, you'll recall that I did make a very conservative estimate for my heat transfer coefficient. So maybe we want to revisit that with another version of the study. I don't really have to do anything different uh, to this finite element model. I just need to edit the definition of something that's already set up. And we'll switch our heat transfer coefficient from 10 watts per meter square, square degree Kelvin to 15. I didn't make any changes to my CAD model, so I don't need to remesh. The only thing I need to do is hit the Run This Study button and let this study resolve. All right, now remember our goal with this modification is making sure that our ICs are under 100 degrees C. And since I already have that result plot generated, I just have to switch to it and verify what my new integrated circuit temperatures are with this boundary condition change. All right, so you'll see here in a moment, I now have 87 and a half degrees centigrade for my maximum integrated circuit temperature. All right, so that was fairly easy for making that change once I had everything set up. All right, next steps that we need to look at. I have my temperature distribution throughout my finite element model. Now what I need to do is conduct structural analysis, basically the thermal expansion study. So I need to set up a linear static finite element model. I need to represent the fixtures, that's the PCB being fastened to the enclosure, and I'm not manually importing or inputting temperatures. I'm reusing that thermal FEA study results for my linear static finite element model. So this is what that look, looks like. We're going to create a linear static study. We'll give it a name, thermal expansion. And as soon as I create the new study, we'll just take a look at my parts folder. The same materials that we had assigned to all of the parts are also assigned in this study. In this case, my global bonded contact condition means that everywhere that I'm face-to-face -face coincident, the components are going to be perfectly stuck together. Now I'm going to use a fixed hinge restraint to represent the screws contacting or fastening the circuit board into the plastic portion of the enclosure. Um, the important thing to note here is this is actually a very big assumption that I'm making with these fixtures. In this case, the location of the fasteners is not going to change if the outer enclosure actually would in the full study. Here, I'm going into my study properties. I'm bringing in the temperature values from the study that we already ran. In this case, it was uh, reference one thermal constant H values. And I need to specify a reference temperature at zero strain. This is what gives me that delta T for my thermal expansion in this particular linear static study. All right, now I could recreate a mesh here, but if I had made any mesh modifications or customization in that thermal study, I just want to reuse the exact mesh. So I'm going to drag it from the thermal study into my linear static study. That's going to save me a little bit of time for getting this uh, set up. I'm also going to go into my study properties, and for this particular model, I'm also going to use the Intel Direct Spar Solver. And we'll go ahead and run this linear finite element model, linear static finite element model. All right, so that did take a little bit longer to solve, so we'll just jump right into the results. And the first result plot that I'm taking a look at is maximum von Mises stress. At this point, I'm not really concerned about the overall stress. I'm more concerned about the overall displacement of the printed circuit board. So I'm going to switch to a resultant displacement plot, and that shows me the displacement results for all of the components in this study. So just like I did in the thermal analysis, I'm going to create a specific displacement plot. In this case, our out-of-plane displacement, which is one of our requirements, happens to be the Y displacement of our circuit board. I'm going to choose the circuit board and also adjust my legend so I only see the values that the printed circuit board is going to experience. OK. So uh, recapping our FEA results for thermal analysis, when we did the thermal FEA study, we found that we had a maximum temperature of 87.5 degrees C. And our linear static results indicated that we had a maximum out-of-plane displacement of 0 0.05 millimeters. And that's much less than what we um, have for a design requirement. Uh, now, you have to remember, we did make some assumptions for 
setting up not only the thermal study but also our linear static FEA. Uh, and that primarily was the heat transfer coefficients that were used in the thermal study. So in order to get a better understanding of what's going to happen to the product, we need to use SOLIDWORKS flow simulation here. And just to recap, here are the different products for SOLIDWORKS flow simulation. Uh, the base capabilities are on the top row. We also have the HVAC module and the electronics cooling module that build in some additional analysis capabilities. And today, the things that we're going to use in SOLIDWORKS flow simulation are internal analysis. We're also going to use the thermal solver. We're going to solve this as a steady state problem, just like we did in the thermal FEA study. And once we wrap up everything, we'll get to use export to FEA for taking our CFD results and use them inside SOLIDWORKS flow simulation. All right. So uh, for setting up the flow project, it's not entirely different than what we did for the thermal FEA study. We just need to set up the heat power uh, for the integrated circuits, the transformers, and the capacitors. And this time, rather than manually specifying a heat transfer coefficient, we're going to let flow simulation calculate the energy dissipation due to our force convection effects. So what we need to do now is go back to the electronic enclosure. Uh, I need to use the entire enclosure. I'm going to simplify it a little bit, just like we did for the circuit board design. And I have a configuration that I've already set up that removes a lot of the uh, extraneous components that we really don't need. So all flow projects should start with the wizard. I'll just give this a name, choose the current configuration, use a unit system, and in this case, just for consistency, we're going to choose degree centigrade. Uh, if I wanted to create a new unit system, I could, but it's really not important for what we're doing here. Now I just need to continue on with the wizard, make sure that I'm including everything that I need here. So this is going to be internal analysis, heat conduction and solids. I uh, need to make sure we turn that on. And then we're going to include a fluid. So air is what's blowing through the enclosure. Now if we needed to include humidity or multiple, multiple gases in this point, we could. Uh, I do need to specify the default material that's going to be used for this analysis. In this case, it's going to be insulator. And then I could set up any additional wall conditions if those were important. And then the last thing that I need to do in the wizard is specify my initial temperatures, in this case, temperature of the environment and initial temperature of all of the solids. All right, so that wraps up everything that we need to do with starting our flow project. And you'll notice I get a feature tree on the left-hand side, my property manager. Now it's time to start working in SOLIDWORKS flow simulation and setting up our project completely. All right, a little housekeeping. I'm going to hide the top plastic enclosure, and I'm also going to hide the computational domain for our flow project. Now, I could choose to import all of the materials right from SOLIDWORKS, but you'll notice if I'm missing any material property from the SOLIDWORKS material library, I'm going to have an issue with my flow project. So here what I'm going to do is manually define a number of materials. Uh, in this case, I just need to find the right materials from the engineering database for flow simulation. And we're going to start out with 302 stainless steel. And I need to clear out what was in that top dialog box and go back and assign 302 stainless steel to the two ending uh, uh, steel plates at the end of the enclosure. Now I need to find copper. We're going to assign copper to both of the transformers. This is assuming that that entire component is made of copper, so another assumption that I'm making in my analysis. And the last thing that we're going to do here is assign aluminum to the heat sinks and then any other components that might get specific materials. All right, now I'm not going to do all of them. We'll continue on with the rest of the things that I would need to set up. Uh, the circuit board is an interesting one. That is an anisotropic or an orthotropic material. So here what we're going to do is we're going to set up the circuit board as a four-layer PCB. And the key here is the heat transfer for the circuit board is different through the thickness of the board. So you, you might have noticed there very quickly, I had to specify the y-axis as the reference direction. That's essentially the thickness of the board. That's different heat transfer coefficient, uh, sorry, um, not heat transfer coefficient, a different uh, conduction coefficient through the thickness of the board than in the plane of the board. All right, the next thing that we need to do is start thinking about boundary conditions. So I need to put in some flow openings for 
my flow simulation project. In this case, I have built some bodies that are closing off those openings at one end, and we're specifying environmental pressure at 20 degrees C. That's the air that's going to be pulled into the enclosure, first boundary condition that we need to do. The next thing that we need to take into account is inserting a external outlet fan. So we're pulling the air through the enclosure. I'm going to select a face of another lid and then start going through my predefined list of fans. In this case, I need to look for a specific DC axial fan. It's a Pabst 405F. And if you're interested, I could take a look at what the properties of this fan are in my flow engineering database. You'll notice it's just basing this, uh, these values on a, a curve. If you have a fan that's not in the flow engineering database, you can create your own. That's, that's fairly easy. All right, so we have most of our boundary conditions set up. A couple other things we need to do is take into account heat sources. So in this case, what I really need to do is make sure I'm using the same heat power inputs that I used with the thermal FEA study that we did earlier. So there you saw that I added 10 watts of heat generation from the two integrated circuits. And just to uh, keep track of everything, I'm going to rename that particular boundary condition. All right, so now I need to continue on. I need to do the volume heat sources for the large capacitor, the transformers, the small capacitors. And I definitely want to make sure that I'm using the same values and being careful if it's a per item or a total uh, in flow, just like I did when I was working in SolidWorks, the thermal analysis, the yeah, thermal FEA study. All right, next thing we need to pay attention to. So you remember we were very focused on the temperature of the integrated circuits in the thermal FEA study. Well, in flow simulation, what I'm going to do is add a volume goal to track the temperature of the entire volume of both of the integrated circuits. So here, maximum temperature is a goal for the first integrated circuit. And I'm going to be very particular here. I'm going to call this particular chip under this heat sink chip number one. Specify that's a maximum temperature. And I'm going to do the same thing for the second chip, maximum temperature there as well. Now, there are a few other global goals that I could add. For instance, I'm very interested in the temperature of all of the solid components. So I'm just going to track an average temperature of all of those, maybe also include a maximum temperature of all of those. I might also choose to track maximum fluid velocity, uh, temperature of the air, and so forth. So really, I get to choose what it is that I want the flow solver to focus on, and I'm going to add that as a goal. Staying focused on the integrated circuits uh, and the heat sinks, I don't want to use just the default mesh controls for those. So what I'm going to do is dig into my Flyout Feature Manager design tree, select both the integrated circuits and the heat sinks, and then I'm going to locally refine the mesh of those components. Now, in this case, I want to make sure I get accurate conduction effects for those components, as well as uh, dissipation of energy due to convection around those components. So there I just added what's called a local initial mesh inside SOLIDWORKS flow simulation. This is going to further improve our results for the temperature of the integrated circuits with that additional step. All right, so just to review. We started uh, the wizard for our CFD project. We had to assign a material definition for all of the non-default components. That was everything that we wanted to be something other than insulator. We had to add our fluid inlet and outlet boundary conditions. We used a predefined fan curve for the fan that we're using in that uh, electronic enclosure. We had to define the heat sources, and then we added some project goals for things that we're interested in tracking, and then mesh controls to further refine our results on the most interesting components for our overall study. All right, so now what we need to do is actually mesh and solve this. So I've already meshed it. Here I'm just dragging the finite volume mesh through the enclosure and hiding that, and then just start jumping right into the results. Now with FEA, what I need to do is create new result plots. Um, but here inside SOLIDWORKS Flow Simulation, all I'm going to do is make everything transparent so I can see through everything. Then I can use a probe tool, start dragging my uh, probe cursor over the top of the results on screen. And then rather than create new plots by doing edit definition and modifying that, I'm just going to use this pull-down menu underneath the legend. And that allows me to switch between different results inside SOLIDWORKS Flow Simulation very quickly. 
Now, I have a lot of other customization tools for how I want to visualize the results in flow. I'm just going to flip through a couple of them there so you can see some of the output that you might be able to get. All right, once we're finished with that, maybe I'm interested in seeing temperature on surface of a number of components. Uh, in this case, I could set those up using what I mentioned earlier, the selection sets for the different components. Here I could also just focus on the overall, uh, in this case, the result I'm looking at is the heat transfer coefficients on just the heat sinks. And you'll notice that I have a very wide range of heat transfer coefficients on the surface of both heat sinks. It's definitely not the uniform 10 or 15 watts per meter square degree, degrees Kelvin that we assumed in the thermal FEA. Here you'll notice one of the heat sinks is really good. And the one that's kind of blocked behind that transformer was really bad. It was actually a lot less than 15 watts per meter square degree Kelvin. So big difference here. I'm getting accurate heat transfer coefficients uh, from the surface of the heat sink versus an assumed heat transfer coefficient. All right, the next thing that we are going to take a look at, I'll go ahead and hide that result. Uh, I'm going to set up and show you a flow trajectory. So this is one of the really cool things about SOLIDWORKS flow simulation. A flow trajectory plot, in this case I'm taking a look at velocity, allows me to visualize how well the airflow is moving through the enclosure. And of course, you can see the very low fluid velocities that are around the heat sink for chip number two. Some other things that I might be interested in taking a look at are surface parameters. So here, if I want to know what the uh, in this case, both of those heat sinks, and scroll down my list, you're going to notice heat transfer coefficient. When I show this parameter, it gives me minimum, maximum, and average heat transfer coefficient for those heat sinks. So they're actually close to 16, so I wasn't that far off with my assumption in the thermal FEA study. Here, when I'm looking at the heat transfer coefficient on the large capacitor, it's actually a lot better than what we had done. And I could verify that for any of the other components. Now, you'll recall I did set up a number of goals to track for this analysis. So this is really the output that I really want from flow simulation. And specifically, I'm looking at the maximum temperature of chip one and chip two. Chip number two, well, that's bad news. We're at 118 degrees C, actually a little bit higher than that. So this is a really good opportunity to highlight some of the capabilities that we can use with SOLIDWORKS flow simulation. All right. Maybe I have some different CAD configurations that I now need to investigate. In fact, I need to investigate different fan positions than what we had in the top left. That was the right fan position, and that one's not going to work. So my next steps with this design are to create configurations uh, like you see on the top right. I'll move the fan to the left side of that back enclosure. Maybe I put in two fans, or maybe I try and center the fan and pull air across both of the integrated circuits evenly. Now each of these, I have to make sure that I can make all of these changes in my design, but I'll build all the CAD configurations, and right now we're going to assume that each of these are a valid design. All right, so the next steps for us with our flow simulation, uh, like I said, we're going to create all the configurations of our electronic uh, enclosure assembly. Rather than recreate the wheel, we have a tool in SOLIDWORKS flow simulation called clone, where I'm going to clone this initial right fan flow project to each of the new CAD configurations. I do need to verify the setup for all of the new projects, especially the one where we have the second fan. And then what I'm going to do is batch run all of the new flow projects. That way I can get up from my computer and let it do some heavy lifting while I'm away. So here what you're going to see is the steps that I need to do for cloning the right fan configuration. Select that it's going to go on the left fan configuration. Uh, I could copy the results, but um, the mesh is going to change and several other things are going to change, so there's really no need to do that. We'll just start from scratch uh, with that. Now what I need to do, I definitely need to revisit the flow project for the two fans, and we need to specify the same uh, external outlet fan. So we'll dig back into our list and make sure we apply the 405F fan to the second face here on our flow simulation model. And then the next thing that we'll do, like I mentioned, we'll go into the batch run capability for SOLIDWORKS flow simulation. Uh, so here I have a list of all of the different flow projects that exist. I'm just going to clear out everything, and what I would need to do is specify both mesh and solve my project two for the left fan, project three for two fans, and project four for the middle fan. 
Now, I could click the Run button at this point, but I have a pretty powerful computer, so maybe I'm going to choose to run two of these flow projects at once and then hit the Run button. So uh, again, don't do this if you have a, a very slow computer, not a lot of memory, and not a lot of cores. Uh, if you have a very powerful computer, running multiple flow projects at once is the way to go. All right, now we're not going to dig through all of the individual results. We're just going to take a look at one of the solved versions and see what we have here. So now we're looking at a temperature plot across the, the surface of one of the planes in the model. And we're going back and we're looking at a goal plot just to verify the temperatures of each of the integrated circuits. Those goals were cloned in the project. All right, now I don't want to have to switch back and forth between all of the different projects. So what I'm going to do is use the Compare Results tool. And I'm going to choose my goal plot from the list. So you know, notice any result plot that was created, I could select that. And then here I'm just going to specify which projects that I want to include in my comparison. And once I run the comparison, I switch to the Goal Plot tab. And now I can see all of the goals that I specified for each of the projects, as well as the temperatures that I'm most interested in. So here I can see that the configuration O2, the left version, looks pretty promising. Uh, so does the two fans version, but that's going to cost extra money plus wiring. Uh, so we may not want to include that one. And then the middle configuration, um, well, it looked like it worked. I was pretty close to 100 degrees C. So maybe we want to take a look at that one as well. So those are the, the interesting ones for us to take a look at. All right, so I'm going to clear out my results here. And the next thing that I'm going to do is, since I had two different configurations that look promising, but they were very simplified versions, what I'm going to do is switch to the full assembly configuration where I'm adding the additional components into my CFD project. The reason for this is they're even going to further block the airflow. So for this final couple of iterations of both the left and the middle design, I want to make sure I include all of the details so I'm getting the right fluid flow, the right temperature distribution through the entire project or through the uh, computational domain. And of course, I would do the same thing. After I've cloned those, I'm going to use the batch run and solve both of those. All right, now that would take a while because it's a fairly extensive mesh with all of those additional components. So we'll just cut to the chase and show all of the final results. All right, so uh, we started out with the right fan design. Um, in the, our FEA study, we thought that would work. It turns out when we use fluid dynamics that that doesn't work. The left fan design was promising, the middle fan design was promising, and of course our two fan design was promising. Then after I solved the left fan full configuration and the middle fan full configuration, it turns out that moving the fan as close to pulling air across integrated circuit number two is really the way that we need to go. So this is a good thing. We've gone through a number of different design iterations and we found basically that our thermal FEA while it gave us decent results, the assumptions that we made would have led us down a very bad path. Using flow simulation, we've now determined that if we use the left fan configuration, that both of our integrated circuits should stay well beneath 100 degrees C. Now, we're not quite finished yet. Now that we have accurate temperatures from SolidWorks flow simulation project, we need to reuse that data inside our thermal FEA or linear static FEA study. Now, I can also include the fluid pressure from SOLIDWORKS flow simulation, which I'm going to do, as you'll see here in a minute, although the fluid pressure effects on all of these components is actually pretty negligible. Uh, the one thing that I do need to make sure that I show you is we actually have to translate the data from our flow simulation project into finite element analysis. So we're taking data from a finite volume solution and using it as an input in finite element analysis. And before we get to that, um, just some other things to think about. You know, maybe I want to change uh, my heat sink design, maybe use taller fins. Maybe I have a couple of different heat sink vendors that I want to investigate. I could create configurations of those and include them in a new flow project. Maybe you have the uh, flexibility of moving the integrated circuits on the circuit board to try and maximize your airflow and cooling. Maybe you could change the size of your air inlets or maybe even investigate different fans. At this point, it's really entirely up to you before you move forward with the structural analysis. But I digress. Let's take a look at how we get the data from SOLIDWORKS flow simulation into SOLIDWORKS simulation. 
Use a couple of pull-down clicks, and this is the key, export results to simulation. Now, this does take about 15 or 20 seconds to transform all of that data from the finite volume solution to finite elements, but that's really the, what we want to see there, that the export was successful. Once we have that, now what I'm going to do is verify which flow result file, in this case it's number seven, that I need to use. And inside my full assembly, I'm going to start a new linear static analysis called CFD thermal expansion. So because I'm in the full assembly, I'm including all of the components here. So if I take a look at my parts window, uh, you'll notice everything. Well, I'm not going to do that here in just a minute. What I need to do is get to the flow simulation results first. So there is my temperature boundary conditions. And like I said earlier, we'll include our pressure boundary conditions from that flow project number seven. All right. Next thing we need to take a look at, yeah, here we go. So I have a number of components that are included that I am really not interested in. So rather than creating a configuration, I'll just selectively go through and start excluding all of these components from this particular study. Now, there's a lot of components to exclude, so that would take a little bit. Uh, we won't go through all of that, but hopefully you understand all I'm doing is getting rid of the stuff that I don't need. All right, so the next thing that I would want to do after I've corrected all of that and I have a mesh overlaid, my contact conditions are still the same that we had before. My fixed hinges are still representing the screws attaching this to the structure. The key is once I show the mesh, one of the things that I can do is take a look and visualize what the flow results are mapped onto my finite element model. So here in just a moment, you're going to see the temperature distribution. These are the results from the CFD project mapped to all the components in my linear static analysis. All right, now that I have this set up, we'll go ahead and hide that plot. And now I need to go ahead and solve this study. This is using my thermal and pressure boundary conditions from my CFD study as inputs into my linear static analysis. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at our results. Here I can see the stress mapped on everything. I already have a Y displacement plot created, focusing on just the circuit board, just like I did earlier. And here we can see when we're using accurate temperature and pressure data from our CFD study, that we get a maximum out-of-plane displacement of our circuit board of about 0 0.065 millimeters. So this is a really good thing for us. From our flow simulation results, we know that our in integrated circuit temperatures are below our di design constraints, and our out-of-plane deformation for our circuit board is still well within operating limits. So the key there is Rather than assuming either temperature or convection coefficients, we actually used accurate temperature distribution from our SOLIDWORKS flow simulation project. I did include the fluid pressure from the SOLIDWORKS flow simulation project, even though it was negligible. And then, of course, the key was I had to translate that data from the finite volume solution to the finite element analysis and use that as a boundary condition. So just to highlight a number of things that I talked about in the catapult section, uh, selection sets, not just a CAD tool, and SOLIDWORKS simulation, specifically the thermal analysis, we were looking for temperature distribution. And one of the big things that I won't call it gave us inaccurate results, but that's kind of what it did, is we had to assume that our heat transfer coefficients are a constant value. And that's not true when we're dealing with fluid movement. As far as the linear static analysis and SOLIDWORKS simulation, we use the thermal analysis results as a boundary condition. And we also, as far as our results, uh, we got stress, strain, and displacement output. And we were able to create results plots on the very specific components of most interest to us. Uh, not only looking at the integrated circuit temperatures from the thermal study, but also the out-of-plane displacement uh, on just the circuit board. And then using SOLIDWORKS flow simulation, we use a coupled thermal and flow solver. That gives us very accurate heat transfer results. We focused the flow solution by using goals, specific, specifically the maximum temperature of the integrated circuits. 
And lastly, we use some really cool tools. We clone projects uh, to other CAD configurations once we already had one flow project set up. And then, of course, the all-important, export our CFD results to FEA for performing structural analysis. Now, in the big scheme of things, what I'd like you to remember about the SOLIDWORKS analysis tools are they truly allow you to have unlimited design iterations. It's going to help you build confidence in your design. And believe it or not, using the right analysis tools early and regularly in your product development process will save you time and money as well as your company time and money. All right, so that's all I have uh, for a presentation today. And Kurt? I believe you probably want to mention this slide here. Great. Yes. Thank you, Bill, for a great presentation. That was really good information about this interaction between our simulation tools. I really appreciate your effort there. And we'll uh, highlight the upcoming webinars for you. Uh, next week, we've got our uh, scan to 3D print with Creoform and Stratasys. And then uh, in early September, we get into uh, data management with uh, Inovia and SOLIDWORKS PDM early September. And followed by another um, simulation uh, webcast September 13th about uh, plastic part design. Actually, uh, that's the uh, mold tools, I believe. And uh, I don't know if we'll get into the injection molding there or not, but I believe it does. Uh, and then finally, September 20th, our next uh, catapult session will be looking to turn your SOLIDWORKS into your kinematic whiteboard. Should be interesting there. Uh, you have the link there uh, at the bottom of that uh, page to see where you can go get the schedule for all of our events. Bill, thank you very much for a great presentation. You're welcome, Kurt. And folks, thank you very much for your attendance, and we look forward to seeing you in another webcast soon. Thanks, and have a great day.